Hey, I wanna, I wanna welcome you, whether you're joining us online or you're here physically at our Peoria campus. My name is Travis Brown. I'm the campus pastor here in Peoria. And I just know that, man, this weekend, there's a lot of people who maybe are coming back to church for the first time in a while, maybe you've been gone for the summer, or maybe you're checking us out for the very first time. And we are so honored that you're here. Our, our church is, uh, is, exists to lead people to Jesus. And we hope that you do that during the service. We hope that you're able to experience community while you're here during service, after service. But we're honored that you joined us no matter who you are, no matter where you're from. And you picked a great weekend to be here as we're kicking off a brand new series. Our senior pastor, Ashley Woldridge, is gonna come share a powerful message later on in our service. But right now we have the privilege of singing and worshiping together. So I wanna invite you to stand to your feet and let's worship God together. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
sing to him. Come on, sing this. We say, the peace like a river flowing freely to the sea. And I hear you calling, come to freedom, come to me in every breath. Yeah. Every season, he's the song we sing. You are the song I sing. You are the air I breathe. I know that all good things come from you, God. You see it? So open my eyes to see your mercy in every. from you God yeah come on and hope like a sunrise every morning you are calling me to light come out of hiding come out of darkness come and step into the light a new day is dawning come see the beauty simply to him. Come on. But hallelujah. It means praise be to God. And hallelujah. In every season, every circumstance, we declare it. Come on. And
know, ever, ever since our music team released the album a couple days ago, that song has been playing on repeat with me because I think it's painted such a great picture of what God's presence does in our lives. It makes dead things come alive. Thank you so much for singing. You can be seated. You know, there's, there's something about receiving a personal letter from somebody that's really meaningful, isn't it? I, I tend to keep these, at least, at least the encouraging ones, I tend to keep these in a safe place and I keep them for a really long time. And in case some of you are wondering what this is, this is something that, that all of us had to use many, many years ago. This is, this is called paper, okay? <laughs> but, but I don't know if you know this, but did you know that as a church, we send literally thousands of personal letters out into our community and all around the world every single week. Some of those personal letters are letters of encouragement. Some are letters of comfort. Some are letters to forgive. Some are letters seeking forgiveness. But every single personal letter that gets sent out is filled with truth and boldness and love. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes these words to the church in Corinth. He says, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. See, the letters that we send out every single week as a church are not typed on a computer or even written on a piece of paper, but the thousands of letters that get sent out every single week into our communities and all around the world our people, it's you, it's me. It's people who have Christ's spirit written on the tablets of our hearts who are going into our communities every single day. But why do these letters get sent out every day? Well, that's easy, it's, it's in response to God's letter to us. You see, God's perfect letter to us is Jesus. You see, Jesus, came so that we could live life. And the reason that we go out into our communities every single day and we try to provide encouragement and hope and comfort in, in things beyond what we can experience in this life is because that's exactly what Jesus brought to us. And that's exactly what we remember every single week when we take communion together. We remember how Jesus came to this earth, sacrificed himself so that we could experience life. And so in a few moments, as you're taking the bread and the juice, I, I pray that you would praise God for his sacrifice that he made for you. And I pray you would also reflect on how he wants to use you to reach others as you get sent out every single day. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us this moment where we get to reflect on the sacrifice that you made. Thank you for allowing us to worship you through song. I, I pray that our prayer time now would, would be used by you to just show us how you wanna use our lives to impact other people. Bless this time, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Everybody doing good? I, I am, hey, I am fired up to preach. It was so good to just worship together um, on all of our campuses. And uh, before I get into the message, I wanna just let you know a couple things, all right? One is, um, speaking of worship, our, our amazing music team has just released a brand new album called Perspective. And I think it, it has some very amazing songs that I hope will guide you through your week and I hope you'll download it and just listen to it wherever you listen to music. And um, you need to know something unique about our church. Um, and this is my heartbeat. We have decided not to monetize anything at CCV. We don't monetize things, all right? We just rely on the, the gifts of people in our church. And so with this music, um, our musicians don't make anything. As a church, we don't make anything. We just wanna give this away for free and let it be a resource to you to help worship God during the week. And we give it away to other churches so that this can go as far as God wants to take it to help other churches worship God as well. So hope you'll, hope you'll download that. It's, a, it's an incredible resource. You know, as I think back on this summer, we've had a great summer. We've had a, a series in June that Mark preached, Colossians, which I thought was great. At the Movies is always impactful, and we do that really as a, as a way for you to have a really easy invite for your friends. And then we had all of our summer camps this, this summer. And if you remember about our summer camps, I told you we're, we, we were trying to send, uh, our goal was over 10,000 kids and students to camp. It was more students and kids than we've ever sent in the history of our church. We wanna create a revival with the next generation. And so many of you gave to our camp fund. And so I just wanna tell you the results of your giving because we met that goal of giving. So I wanna show you the results, all right? In 2019, to put it in perspective, we sent about 6,000 kids and students to camp. Last year, 2021, we sent about 7,700 kids. And this year, we sent almost 11,000 kids and students to camp. That's a 42% increase. And, you know, so many churches are praying for revival. You're in the middle of one. Like that's a revival what God is doing with the next generation and it's because of so many of you that gave that we get to see that. But here's the best number of all to me. Because of what God's doing and your prayers and your giving, this summer we are seeing a 60% increase in baptisms from camp over last year and that is incredible. It's just, it's incredible. So I, wanna, I just wanna say, I wanna say thank you uh, to, our, to our church. Speaking of those that are investing in the next generation, um, as the fall kicks into gear, um, I think it's very appropriate as a church that we spend some time praying for our teachers, administrators, and everyone working in our local school systems. And so what I wanna do right now, before I get into the message, is if you are a teacher, if you're an administrator in a local school, if you have any position working in a local school, investing in the next generation, I wanna ask you to stand up, don't be shy, just stand up right where you're at in your seats all across our campuses. Stand up, um, let's give them a hand. You are heroes um, in our midst, we honor you. We honor you. And stay standing, stay standing, stay standing. Because what I wanna do is I wanna ask our church to join me we're gonna pray for you that God blesses this school year. All right, would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for every teacher, for every administrator, for every person behind the scenes, for every person that's investing in our schools. I believe some of them right now are discouraged. They're wondering what the school season's gonna be like. And I just pray right now, you put not only their, your peace in their hearts, but would you put energy and passion so that this is one of the best school years they've ever had. And I pray for, for those a part of our church that they would go out and be a bright light in our community as day in and day out they invest in kids and students. And we as a church wanna honor them and we wanna ask you to bless them during this school year. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's give them a hand one more time. We honor you, teachers. Love you. Thank you. Well, this week we start a brand new series, five part series, five weeks called The World Spins Madly On. And I wanna start with a question. How many of you feel like our world is spinning out of control? Anybody? I wouldn't even ask you to raise your hands because almost all of us feel it, right? 
And, and I, don't, I don't know where you feel it most. Um, it could be that you feel it in all the economic uncertainty around you. It could be that you look at all the wars on, on the news. You look at the senseless killings in the headlines and it just hits you. It could be that, that you see our divided political system and it just makes you scratch your head. Like, what is wrong? It could just be the complete and utter decline of morality in our society with people doing whatever they want, however they want. I mean, it's just, it, it's crazy. I don't know where you feel it. At, for me, I'll tell you, I feel it most raising kids um, in our current world. And I had a moment, and I don't know if you've ever had this moment, I had a moment where it hit me, our world is out of control. And that moment for me was when I came home one day and my wife said, hey, for the kids, I wanna get a cat. Can we get a cat, all right? Um, I'm just kidding. Jamie did not ask for a cat, all right? If she asked for a cat, that means the world is over. It's done, right, okay? Those of you that are new, not the biggest cat fan, all right? I know some of you are, and I love you, all right? No, we did get a dog, by the way, though, and uh, we've had a, we have a new dog, and I'm sure in some future messages, I'll share some of the disaster stories there as well, all right? So we have that going on. No, the moment where it hit me the most is when I sent my oldest daughter years ago to, to high school. Her freshman year of high school, she came home uh, from her first week and she had been in a classroom. And I told this story once before, but I'll tell it again. She was in a classroom and she was getting to know this girl that sat next, next to her. It was a brand new girl. She didn't know her. And so before class would start, oftentimes they would just talk with each other. And this one day they were in, in class and this little girl, uh, this, this 15 year old girl leans over to my daughter and she says this. She says, Carly, 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 guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Carly's like, what? What's so exciting? And she goes, tonight I get my first sugar daddy. And Carly thought she was talking about the candy sugar daddy. So she goes, that's awesome. I love sugar daddies. <laughs> and this girl said, I know. My friend lined it up. And Carly goes, your friend is so nice. <laughs> then the girl said, I know. All I have to do is sleep with this guy one night, and he'll give me enough money to buy a car. And it hit Carly. She's not talking about the candy sugar daddy. Carly just kind of said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. You know, she tried to talk her out of it. She said, you can earn money other ways. I'll help you earn money. And she was just trying to talk this girl out of making a massive mistake. And finally, this girl looks at Carly and she's kind of just disgusted and confused. And she says, Carly, why do you have to be so prude? And when Carly told me that story, it just ripped my heart open as a dad. And I realized our world is spinning out of control. Maybe you've had a moment like that. You know, maybe it was at your workplace where you just see the, the, the you know, the, nobody's following the rule. I mean, all this lying and cheating. It could be if you're single and dating in the 21st century, the expectations on you sexually when you go on a date and you're like, what is, what is happening? It could just be, you know, what you see in the headlines every day. You could see all the vile things post, people post online and say online or just all the, the news headlines and it's just hitting you. We're spinning out of control. And the question we're gonna answer in this series is not just how do we stand strong in a world spinning out of control. The question we're gonna try to answer is what do we do to turn the tide? And we're gonna do that by looking at one man's life in scripture, a man named Elijah. Now, Elijah is this mighty man of God. If you don't know a lot about him, let me just give you a little bit of context. His story is found primarily in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19. He's an Old Testament prophet, and he is one of the greatest men of God in Scripture. For example, in the New Testament, when John the Baptist hits the scene, it says that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. When Jesus comes, many people thought Jesus was the second coming of Elijah. Now, what made Elijah so mighty? It's that he served during a time in history when Elijah's world was spinning more out of control than even our world today. Just to give you a little history 
And this will help you understand Elijah, but this will also help many of you read the Old Testament because sometimes it's hard to get through the Old Testament. Um, Part of the history of the Old Testament is when God takes the nation of Israel and brings them to the promised land and they're being established, when the nation starts off, they follow the one true God. I mean, they, they really are doing well. They're primarily doing well under two kings, King David and King Solomon. But when King Solomon dies, what happens is the nation of Israel splits into two. I want to show you this map. So you now have the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, which is a little confusing with their capital, Samaria. And then there's the southern kingdom, which is called Judah, with the capital city of Jerusalem. But the kingdom splits in two. And the books of 1 Kings and 2 Kings and the books of Chronicles, it just follows these two kingdoms and the kings that led them. Different kings, but get this. In the northern kingdom, which is where Elijah primarily ministered to, think about this. They had 19 consecutive kings over 200 years, and not one king was good. Not one. What what did the kings in the northern kingdom start to do? They invited the people to start worshiping false gods, primarily two gods, the gods Asherah and Baal. Now, Asherah was the the god of sex and fertility. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And Baal was primarily the god of of the sky and and rain and and fertility on crops. And 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 what we know from the Old Testament is in the northern kingdom, out of all these 19 kings, the worst king was named King Ahab. And Ahab married a wicked woman named Jezebel who introduced so much of this worship of me, again, killing the prophets of God. And it's into this environment that God sees all the darkness, I mean, all the vileness. If I could, if I could, I couldn't even tell you um, on stage, because it would be rated like X, what, what happened during the worship of some of these gods. For example, if you worship the god Baal, you were oftentimes required in other gods to, to sacrifice your kids in fire. The, the worship of Asherah, you would go to a temple and sleep with a prostitute as part of your worship. And this is how bad it got, and God said, enough! And God decided to intersect and change the world. Now, how did God do it? God didn't send an army. He didn't send a plague. You know what God decided to do? God did what God so often does. He raised up one person to go change the world. Where they had influence. God raises up Elijah. And what I believe with everything inside of me is that God is doing the same thing today. He's raising up one man, one woman to go change the world that's spinning out of control around you. I'm telling you, right now on on our campuses, there's a man or a woman that God is raising up. There's There's a teacher, there's a student. God's raising you up to go change your school. God's raising up a business leader to go into your business and to change it forever. God's raising up a single mom right now, a dad, even a grandparent to change the legacy of your family because it is in... It's in shambles right now. God's raising up men and women, Elijah's of our generation. And as we start this series, in week one of the series, what I want to do today is I want to answer the question, how does God prepare you? What does God do to raise up an Elijah? to raise up an Elijah in our generation. And I wanna show you that looking at the life of Elijah. So let's dive straight into scripture, 1 Kings chapter 17. I hope you'll just be reading this story as we go through the series. But 1 Kings chapter 17, verse one, we're introduced to Elijah. We don't know much about his childhood, but we're introduced in verse one, it says this. Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, It's like a tongue twister, right? Say Tishbite from Tish or Tishbe like 10 times, you know, you'll mess it up. It it says, he he went to Ahab. This is, remember, this is the most evil king in the over 200 years in the northern kingdom. Went to Ahab. And here's what Elijah says: As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve. Elijah serves God. In fact, did you know that Elijah's name in Hebrew literally means 
the Lord is my God. That's what Elijah's name means. He says, the, the, the God whom I serve says this, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now Elijah's saying, not his word exactly, but at God's word through him. Now I want, you to, I want you to just understand the weight of Elijah's words, what he says here in this verse. You have to understand that this, this is the year 865 BC, around this time, and in world history, especially in Israel, but across the entire world, the economy was completely run by agriculture, which means this, if there's rain and the crops are growing, the economy is booming, the stock market's up and to the right. If the rain is not coming down and the crops are dying, the economy is in a global meltdown and people are dying. So what Elisha says, when Elisha says, there won't be rain for years, you have to understand what, what he's actually saying. He is directly challenging the god Baal, who people were worshiping. Now why were people worshiping Asherah and Baal? Asherah is the god of sex and fertility, so that's kind of self-explanatory, right? I mean, it, throughout human history, people have struggled chasing sex. But the god Baal, what were they doing? The people began to rely on Baal, thinking he could provide rain for their crops so that their, their economy had security and they had economic security. What were they? They were relying on a false god for economic security versus trusting God for their economic security. And by the way, the same thing happens today. So Elijah is directly challenging the false god they have been relying on. And it, it just, it takes extreme faith what Elisha says, that it's not gonna rain. Now, if it didn't rain, think about our day and age. A lot of people think today we're either approaching or we're in an economic recession. If it didn't rain for months or a year in Elijah's day, it wouldn't be a recession, there would be an economic meltdown. I mean, to put it in our terms, that would be like tomorrow you woke up and every single gas station is closed, there's no gas, every grocery store is closed, you turn on the faucet, there's no water, no electricity at your house, you go to the bank, they have frozen all of your assets and they cancel the NFL season. It'd be pandemonium, all right? There's some guy in the audience going like, I don't know if I'd rather like not have water or the NFL season. I think maybe, well, so I mean, just, it would just, it'd just be pandemonium, right? That's what's, that, that's what's gonna happen in Elisha's day. And, El and Elisha tells this to Ahab, and you kind of feel like, I mean, if you're reading the story, you're like, God's gonna use Elisha right now to change the people, bring them back to God, do it right now, immediately. And that's not what God does. In fact, he does something so different, I think we need to take note because it's what God so often does. God has Elisha confront the king and then you know what God does? God takes Elisha and puts him in an almost three year season of preparation. Why? If you're taking notes today, oftentimes before God can do something big through you, he needs to first work on you. See, oftentimes we, we want God to just move and uh, God, when he wants to do something big through you and God wants to do something big through all of us, but often he's to work on us first. And I'm gonna show you three seasons from 1 Kings chapter 17 that God took Elisha through that I think God is taking men and women through right now to prepare you to do something great for God. I hope you take notes because I think this is worth pondering on. The first season we see from the life of Elijah is this, that God will often humble you privately before using you publicly. He'll often take you through a very private, you know, breaking season of humility before he ever elevates you to use you publicly. And often, or usually, this happens during a painful season of waiting. Now, if you were here in May, we did a series called Letters from My Future Self, and I, I talked about how God so often uses waiting with leaders in Scripture, and we see this, how he prepares us, and, and the same thing happens with Elijah. He, he's, he's in a season of waiting, and God wants to use Elijah in a mighty way, so he, in verse 1, he confronts King Ahab, but watch how clear this is. Watch this. He confronts King Ahab, verse 2, watch what happens. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and he said, Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide. 
in the Kareth Ravine. Hey God, I'm ready to be used by you. Sweet, go hide. Now that the Hebrew word here, hide, literally means to go to a secret, private place. What's God doing with Elijah? He's gonna develop him privately. Now what's so interesting to me is, is he takes him to this place called the Kareth Ravine. The word Kareth in Hebrew literally means to cut off or cut down. It's like if you're gonna cut off or cut down a tree. And, and, and we get the sense that what God is gonna do is God's gonna put Elijah in a season where he's gonna, he's gonna cut him down. He's gonna, he's gonna break him down a little bit. He's gonna develop some humility in him privately and primarily because we're gonna see in a moment because he wants him to develop some deep, deep dependence on him. What I know today is there's many of you today, you're in a Kareth Ravine season. You feel cut off, you feel broken down, and you're wondering, God, what are you doing? And if you are in a season of brokenness right now, I want you to know that it may be painful, but it does not have to be a wasted season. God could be developing something so deep inside you. I remember so many times in my life where I've been in a Kareth Ravine season. I mean, isn't, isn't, isn't life full of these seasons? I remember one season where my parents went through a really deep divorce and I was so broken. God began stripping so many things and I just, I felt so cut off and I went to my pastor and I asked him, what is God doing? I just feel so broken. And I remember that pastor grabbing me and saying, Ashley, if you allow God in this private season of brokenness to, to develop you, he'll use it for something really, really good down the road. And I thought, What? What? And I stand before you now as a man who I believe the marriage I have today to my wife, Jamie, the marriage I have today is in many ways a result of what God began doing in my life in that Kareth Ravine season watching my parents go through that divorce. If you took any leader at our church today and you sat down with them and any leader who's done something great for God and you sat them down and you said, have you ever had a Kareth Ravine season? I guarantee you they would say yes. Guarantee it. They would say, I had a deep season of brokenness and where God had to humble me and do something inside of me before he could ever use me publicly. This is what God does. In fact, A.W. Tozer, one of the greatest theologians, I believe, who's, who's existed, he said something that I even hate to read to you but I believe it's true. A.W. Tozer said this, it's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And if you are hurting here today, you listen carefully. God may be setting you up for the greatest season where he wants to use you that has ever existed in your life. You hold on tightly to the promise of God. This is what God is doing in Elijah's life. And we don't know what God is is truly developing or what he's wanting to do in Elijah's life, but we know one thing specifically from this passage. One thing is so clear, and it is the second season that God oftentimes takes you through. It's that during your waiting, God wants to develop your dependence on him. Watch how clear this is in Elijah's life. He goes to Kareth Ravine, he's he's cut off, he's kind of in this private place, and then verse four says this. In Kareth Ravine, God says, you'll drink from the brook, and I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Uh, Excuse me, ravens? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna bring ravens. They're gonna provide you every day with food. It goes on, so so he, Elijah, did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. He stayed there, and guess what? The ravens ravens brought him bread and meat every morning, and bread and meat every morning in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now, the first thing I think we can take away from this passage is for all you vegetarians, God loves meat. (laughs) Loves meat, all right? I mean, he brought him meat every morning and every night, right? I'm kidding, okay? That's my corny joke, all right? Uh, We have vegetarians in my family. We love you if you're a vegetarian. 
But this is what God does. He brings them food in the morning, food at night, and he, he has a constant supply of water during a crazy drought in the rest of the land. What is the main point of that passage? What is God doing in Elijah's life? He's developing his dependence on God. God is showing Elijah who he can rely on every single day. Elijah, you can rely on me to provide all your needs, not anything else. So every, every day, Elijah gets an Uber Eats order in the morning and in the evening, and he has water to drink every single day. We don't know previously, but maybe Elijah was relying too much on himself. He was in the city, he had resources, he could go get food anytime he wanted to. Now God stripped all that away. If you're in the Kareth Ravine, he's cut off. All you've got is God. That's it. And some of you right now, God has you in a place where he has stripped some things out of your life that you used to depend on for all of your security, your happiness, you're, you're just feeling good. I mean, God's just stripping it away. And it could be your finances. It could be a relationship that you used to rely on and it provided all of your happiness. It could be just a new environment you're in and it, it feels very unsettling and you don't feel secure. And, and what, what you need to know is that if you are in a season where you have to fully, fully depend on God, that is a beautiful season to be in. Why? Because God's developing your dependence. And he may have stripped out of your life, by the way, an idol that you were relying on instead of God. You need to know that one of God's greatest goals in your life is that you would develop more dependence on him and not on what this world has to offer. Why? God cannot use you in a mighty way until you learn to depend on him daily, daily. And this is what God is doing in Elijah's life. And some of you struggle with this because you're like, I don't wanna have to rely on God. I wanna rely on me and my strength and my dependence and I wanna be an independent man or woman. In other words, what you're telling God is, I wanna be God, not you. Someone needs to write this down today. If dependence is the goal, weakness is an advantage. Let me say that again. Let this sink in. It is so countercultural. If dependence is the goal, weakness is an advantage. Why? Because in your weakness, you are more dependent on God. I want to show you a verse that just screams this so loud, you can't miss it. The Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says this. Each time, he, he was in a season where he had to rely on God. Paul says, each time he, that's God, said, Paul, my grace is all you need. My power works best in, say it out loud. Wait a second, God, you're telling me your power works best in my weakness? Yeah, because then you're relying on me, not you. You're not that powerful. Paul goes on to say this. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. What? Yeah, so that the power of Christ can work through me. I'll tell you one of my goals in life. One of my goals in life is for God to work so powerfully in our church and in our staff and in, in, in our city that when people look at me, they're like, that has to be God because he's not that good. I pray that because I'm not, I'm not on my own. I am so weak, but with God, I'm strong. And I think God just sometimes puts us through seasons where he strips things away so that we have to depend on him and if you're in a season where you have to depend on God, don't fight it so much. Just embrace learning to be dependent on God. Because remember, when Elisha, when he's going to provide for Elisha, how did God provide for Elisha? Did he give him a three-month supply and say, hey, call me when it runs out? Did he give him an Amazon Prime subscription where every two weeks it showed up at his door? How did God provide for Elijah? How was it? Daily. 
Every single day, Elijah had to wake up and rely on God for that day. You know what so many of us struggle with? What I struggle with. We worry so much about tomorrow. We worry about our 401k. We worry about if we'll ever be able to afford a house in the crazy Phoenix housing market. We'll worry about our kids and if we'll ever get into college, we'll be able to pay for college. We worry so much about tomorrow and what God wants to remind us is, hey, have I provided for you today? Have I provided for you today? Then don't worry so much about tomorrow. I control that. You worry about today. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter six. Hey, stop worrying so much about tomorrow. Today has enough to worry about on its own. And he ends that passage in Matthew 6, 33, one of the most powerful passages in scripture. He says what? Jesus says what? Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and say it out loud. All these things that you worry about will be given to you as well. What's the formula? You be obedient today to God. And you let him worry about your future, not you worrying about it so much. This is what God's teaching Elijah. He develops him privately, humbles him privately before he ever is gonna use him publicly. He develops his dependence on God. And then God puts him in a third season, which is so powerful. Number three, finally, God's gonna call you to radical obedience. First Kings chapter 17, verse seven through nine, sometime later, we don't know how long, but probably months, uh, Elijah's been at, at Kareth Ravine. He's cut off, he's all alone, he's dependent on God. Sometimes later, the brook dried up. The water's gone, the Uber Eats deliveries are gonna stop. Because there's been no rain in the land, then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah. He said, I want you to go to Zarephath, Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply your food. Now, you have to put yourself in the story again to understand this. Remember, there's an economic meltdown. There's no food or water. Like Israel's like done. The crops are dry. It's not raining. Where's, where's Elijah been? He's in Kareth Ravine. He, he gets food every day and water every day. Life is good. And all of a sudden the brook dries up and God says, I want you to go to some place called Zarephath. And you're like, what does that mean? Let me show you on a map. Here's where Elisha is. He's in the Kareth Ravine and he has to go almost 100 miles northwest to Zarephath. Now, where where is this? This is enemy territory. Ahab's wife, Jezebel, this is where her family's from. This is the center of Baal and Asherah worship. And that's where God says, I want you to go. That's radical. And then God says, hey, I know there's an economic collapse going on, but don't worry, Elisha, I'll have a widow feed you. Now, in that day and age, the poorest person in that society would have been a widow. So when there's an economic collapse, who's the first person that's gonna run out of food? Widows. And God's like, don't worry, I'll have her provide for you. Now you have to go read the rest of 1 Kings uh, chapter 17 for yourself, but let me just read you a few, few verses to help you really understand what happens. So this is what God tells Elijah, go there, I've developed you privately, I've developed your dependence, now I'm gonna call you to radical obedience. Verse nine, and God says, go at once. Go, don't think about it, don't check it out, go at once. Now the Hebrew, this Hebrew term, go at once, means to stand up and move. This is like picture in your mind, it's like Elisha's been sitting down at Kareth Ravine like Uber Eats, water, I'm good. And God's like, you've sat for long enough, buddy. It's time to stand up in radical obedience and move. And verse 10, I just love the simplicity of Elijah's obedience. Watch this, verse 10. So he went. So he went. He didn't question God. He just radically obeyed. And if you read the rest of chapter 17, I mean, Elisha goes and this widow who has nothing, God miraculously provides for her and Elijah. Then the widow's son dies and Elijah rises him from the the dead. It's the first resurrection uh, example in all of scripture because what God is foreshadowing what Jesus will do through the life of, of Elijah. And God begins to use Elijah's life in unbelievable ways, unbelievable ways. 
And I can't wait to preach next week. You're gonna see next week. I mean, I'm like fired up about next week. You're gonna see how God's using Elijah. But here's my takeaway for you today. What has God been preparing you for that you need to stand up, move, and radically obey? And as I was writing this message, I was at my desk, I literally fell to my knees and I just began praying, God, what do you wanna say to someone? And I'm gonna give you some things that God pressed on my heart, and if this is you, please understand, this is, this is not me, this is God just prying open your heart and speaking directly to you. And the first group of people I wanna to talk to is, I just wanna say there's a family on a campus right now, and I don't know who you are, but there's a family and your marriage is not good, and your kids are not doing well. And this past summer, you got away on vacation because you have resources and you got away for a little bit and you thought that was gonna solve everything. And here you sit today and you know it's not better. And the missing thing from your life is you have not put God first. In fact, you are very sporadic in when you show up to worship at CCV on the weekends. When it fits your schedule or you feel like it, you come. Otherwise, you're out doing something else. And your radical act of obedience is God is going to call you to sit down this week as a family or if you're a single parent with someone else and you are going to radically commit to God that you will be here every single weekend, no excuses. And if you will do that, I'm just telling you, God will transform your marriage, he'll transform your family, and he'll transform your life. But it takes radical obedience, why? Because successful people do consistently what average people do occasionally. And you can't live one foot in, one foot out with God. It's time to go all in. Plus we need you, I mean your, your gifts are needed in the body of Christ. Let me speak to someone else because it may not be an immediate thing, but God's gonna work on you throughout this series. There's a business leader. You're gonna be called to make a radical change in your business by standing up for something that's not right. You may even be the leader and it's time for you to stand up. God's going to call, he's gonna call someone here to radically change their job. The brook's dried up, you know it, and it's time to use your life for something of more significance. And God may just begin to work on you in that way. He may call someone here to start working with kids and students. You've been sitting down on the sidelines. You've been like, I need more preparation. And God's like, get up and move. These kids and students need you. We sent 11,000 kids and students to camp. They need people to pour into them. I don't know what your radical act of obedience is, but we all have one. It could be baptism, it could be tithing, it could be inviting someone. I don't know what yours is, but all of us, think about this, all of us right now on our campuses are sitting down. And in just a moment, you're gonna stand up. And I pray when you stand up, you move in the obedient direction God's calling you versus living life for you. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the life of Elijah. I just, I just thank you how you prepared him and I think you're doing the same thing with many of us here today. And many of us are feeling a conviction inside of us that we can't ignore. And whatever radical act of obedience you're calling us to, God, would we stand up in just a moment and would we move in your direction and trust you like never before? And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, I'm going to continue the series next week. I think it's a perfect time as new people are moving to the valley to invite someone new. I'll see you then. Until then, hey, get up, let's move. Have a great weekend, CCV.